Place, the biggest airport in Canada. Time, late 80s and early 90s. Event, years of continuous thefts without any evidence that may identify the criminals. Requirements, take your seat, get your popcorn, and put your headphones. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to take off. Pearson, the biggest international airport in Canada, Toronto. The airport has the largest cargo terminals. It receives shipments from all over the world. Millions of goods arrive every day. It is a non-stop process. All of the goods are stored in a large, spacious facility in order to accommodate as many shipments as possible. All sorts of products were stored there. You can find whatever comes to mind. It's like a kid walking into a large toy store. If someone has ever thought about stealing from this place, he will surely get arrested as soon as he is out since the facility is protected by a force of more than 100 police officers. However, in the late 80s and early 90s, the airport administration discovered that many skids of high-end products were disappearing, including cameras, hard disks, computers, and many other products that were valuable at the time, some worth up to a half million dollars. The police immediately formed a task force to discover how the thieves were bypassing the airport's heavy security and steal skids of goods without being noticed. Everything is secure on that perimeter. There are video cameras everywhere, and everyone can see them nearby. There are also security guards. They examine your tag first to ensure it is valid before granting you access. It is a bit confusing. Despite all these precautions, cargo kept disappearing for years, and police investigations were completely pointless. They strongly attempted to put an end to this crime, but ultimately proved ineffective. The investigation procedure was so complicated for many reasons, mainly the late discovery of the stolen cargo by the airport administration. As I said before, the facility was so huge and vast that no one could pay attention to what was missing. A lot of shipments were in and out daily. It was a massive undertaking to try and trace the stolen cargo. Besides, we are in the 90s, there is no inventory storage system. So the whole process was like looking for a needle in a haystack. As a result, the police were also informed too late, which complicated their task. They claimed that the police received the call after a week. The delay in informing the police meant that any evidence that could have been gathered at the scene would be disappeared. The police had no leads and no clue where to start, but the warehouse employees, though the police couldn't get anything from them, they were very cautious and careful in some of their replies. Those workers were like a family or a gang. They know each other very well, since they had been working together for a long time, which means that even if the police thought about penetrating them, it wouldn't work. The thefts kept for years, and the police felt powerless and incapable of preventing them. The police actually came to the conclusion that an organized crime gang operating within the airport was responsible for the thefts. They believe that such operations require a lot of work and time to be executed. The thieves must know all of the ins and outs of the cargo operations. They had to know people in security, supervisors, managers, and truck drivers. Therefore, all of these factors contributed to the belief that a large group of people who worked at the airport were robbing the cargo. However, the police were wrong, and in the end, it turned out that the thefts were done by a single individual, who was neither a director nor a supervisor, so that he could know the ins and outs of the airport, or have extensive knowledge of its operations. The thefts were the work of a simple truck driver, who had managed to find a way to bypass security and steal over $7 million in cargo and sell it worldwide. How did he succeed in accomplishing it? I know you are wondering too. Don't worry. I got the answer. But first, let's know who this man is. The truck driver's name is Ho Lam Ong. He is a Vietnamese immigrant who came to Canada, Toronto, in the late 80s with $50 in his pocket. Our guy was driven by the desire to become wealthy. He was ready to give anything up to achieve his goal, no matter the cost. He began by integrating into the Asian community. He treated people with kindness, which made it simple for him to make friends. He was always smiling when he met people 
which created a great impression on others and helped him build a positive reputation for which he earned the nickname Smiley. After a short period of time, Mr. Smiley met with a woman who was a Vietnamese immigrant too. Her name is Teresa. They had instant chemistry because they were in tune with one another, which allowed them to quickly build a strong relationship. And they married not long after. Mr. Smiley moved into Teresa's apartment and lived with her teenage stepson, Benny. Teresa worked for a shipping company where she had managed to find a job for her husband as a truck driver. Mr. Smiley's job was to pick up goods from the Pearson Airport and deliver them to businesses throughout the city. But this job paid only $1,600 per month, which was a low salary for Mr. Smiley to achieve his dream of becoming rich. Mr. Smiley used to deliver the goods himself, which meant that he arrived at the shipping address, got out of his truck, took the goods and walked into the store, giving him a good idea of the prices of the goods he delivered. Since the items he carried were highly valuable, he knew that if he could just steal a few of them and sell them, he would undoubtedly become wealthy. However, considering that it was his duty to deliver the cargo, he was unable to steal from it. Then he realized that entering the warehouse directly was the greatest place to steal covertly though he didn't have a pass that allows him to enter inside the warehouses, which means that when he arrived at the airport, he must present his ID card and his pass to the security guards. This card must remain hanging around his neck throughout the time he spends inside the warehouse. The pass he had restricted him to a small area of the warehouse where he had to stand and wait for the workers to bring the goods before loading them into the truck himself. So Mr. Smiley found himself forced to get closer to the workers. He already had a smooth relationship with them since he was always smiling from day one. So he just needed to make it a bit stronger and he found that the right way to do that was by actually inviting them to dinners, giving them gifts and so on. Mr. Smiley continued to strengthen his relationships with the workers, attempting to create a kind of networking in order to achieve his goal and one of the things he focused on was spotting the workers who needed money the most, as well as those who had loans and bills to pay. He was completely certain that this category of workers was an easy target. One day, while one of the workers was loading Mr. Smiley's truck, the latter approached him and asked if he could throw an extra skid of goods without telling anyone in exchange for $2,000. The worker was stunned. It was a tempting sum of money for him and he immediately accepted the deal because he knew they wouldn't discover the missing cargo for a long time and that it wouldn't be trackable. Mr. Smiley came back home and opened the cargo he got from the worker and found it full of electronics that worth up to $100,000. We're talking about a successful investment here. He paid $2,000 to earn $100,000, but the problem was that he needed buyers for his products. So he began making connections with computer store owners and selling them the goods for reasonable prices. Of course, prices that are lower than the market. Another time, Mr. Smiley paid one of the workers again in order to let him load an extra skid of merchandise. This time it was clothes cargo, which was of course worth less than the electronics, but still profitable. And he had managed to sell it to some of his friends and contacts for a lower price as usual. So, Things went on as usual. His network grew in terms of workers he bribed to assist him in his stealing operation, as well as store owners or people to whom he sold his stolen goods. And this is where his empire began to grow. Nevertheless, he was still dealing with a huge problem. Because the stolen cargo was randomly chosen, he had no idea about the products he stole, whether they were electronics, clothes, or something else. That is to say, each time he stole a cargo, he got new products and was forced to look for new buyers that could buy them, which made his retailing process a bit complicated. To solve this problem, he decided to work with her wife, who was his accomplice in his thefts. They both worked for the same company, as we mentioned before, so his wife took advantage of her work. Theresa had access to detailed information about incoming cargo. She could tell him the flight that it came in on the amount that it's worth, which area that it would be stored, 
Using the information from Teresa Mr. Smiley, carefully studied what cargo is going to which warehouse. He cross-referenced this to lists of employees he knew he could bribe. This way, his thefts became more organized, which helped him sell the stolen goods easily. Sometimes they are sold before even being stolen. In order to increase his profits and expand his empire, Mr. Smiley began targeting expensive cargo. However, the more cargo he stole, the more issues he confronted because of the amount of stolen cargo. It was vast and huge, which made the delivering process difficult. So he decided to add his steps in Benny to his accomplices. Mr. Smiley treated him as his son, and so did Benny. He respected him so much. Benny took the distribution task of electronics and computer accessories and proved himself as an excellent salesman better than his stepfather. He created his own connections with computer store owners. To gain their trust, Benny used to present invoices and business cards bearing his alias, Joe Yang, in order to appear to work for a legitimate shipping company that didn't exist. So most of store owners believed that they were undoubtedly buying legal goods from a credible source. Despite Benny's ability to sell the stolen goods normally, without problems, and in a short period of time, the Smileys were still facing storage issues because of the consecutive theft operations that led to the goods accumulation. Mr. Smiley needed a safe place where he could store his goods, and because renting public storage space was risky, he bought two houses that were next to each other. He lived in one and used the other as a storage facility. Every day, the Smileys brought a cargo and stored it in their house. The neighbors would frequently see the Smileys coming and going with their cargo, which seemed strange and unusual to them, making them curious about what was going on around them. Mr. Smiley's pleasant personality served as his currency. He was a lovely person. He always talked nice to his neighbors. He respected them, and so did they. He even gave them gifts very often. And this way of treating people made him beyond suspicion. Even if someone asked him why he had all those goods stored in his house, he would simply tell him that he worked in the shipping industry and that he sometimes used his house as a warehouse. His empire was gradually expanding, as were his distribution issues. He had a supply and demand problem. Buyers were fewer than the goods he had, so everything in his house was in surplus. Fortunately, at that time, in the late 90s, it was the beginning of internet revolution. So a group of websites appeared, including eBay, a website that can be used to sell or buy anything from anywhere in the world and provides the possibility of registering without an identity and without valid bank accounts and addresses. All that mattered was buyer satisfaction, regardless of how the product was made or where it came from. That was not a priority, only that the customer get what they were promised and be content with the purchase. Mr. Smiley took advantage of the website and started selling his stolen goods and with the prices he offered. The sales flooded in, not only from Canada, but from all over the world. The Smileys started working on packaging and shipping from their house or warehouse, which made the selling process easier, faster, and more profitable. The Smileys were able to reach 19,000 sales thanks to eBay, which increased their fortune and allowed them to keep their empire growing and active for 13 years. This is unbelievable, isn't it? The thefts lasted for more than a decade without being noticed by the police or the airport administration. Mr. Smiley considered the cargo workers the key to his operations, so he insisted on letting them be satisfied by gifts, paying their bills, staying by their sides whenever they needed help, or simply by bribing them. In this way, he was able to make sure that these workers remained loyal to him and kept his operations running. For more than 13 years, the investigation into this case remained stuck, even after intensifying their efforts by going undercover. The police had not been able to identify the person who was responsible for those thefts during this time. They only watched cargo being loaded onto trucks. They had no way of knowing if it was being stolen or if it was just routine business. Due to this state of uncertainty, the police stayed powerless to narrow down their lists of suspects. There were hundreds of warehouse workers, which made their task nearly impossible 
and automatically, Mr. Smiley definitely stayed under the radar. Finally, on November 2001, the police found their first lead when one of the computer store owners reported that someone had broken into his store and robbed him. The police moved immediately and searched the store, discovering that among the stolen items were hard drives. Police discovered that the hard drive serial numbers from the computer store theft matched the numbers from the airport theft. For the first time, police have traced some of the stolen goods. The police questioned the store owner about where he purchased those hard drives. The store owners revealed that the hard drives had been purchased from a shipping company that was represented by someone named Joe, and he gave them a phone number to contact him. After checking the number, the police discovered that it belonged to Benny, and they immediately placed him under surveillance. The surveillance helped the police so much, it was quite intense, and it led them to a lot of facts. They saw Benny collecting goods from their house, and they saw a wall of goods when he opened the garage. The police realized that they finally found the thief that they had been looking for years ago, and then they found out that the owner of the house was Mr. Smiley. The police hold off on making an arrest until they have gathered sufficient evidence to build a strong case. They wanted to find out how exactly he managed to steal such huge amount of goods during this long period. A team of investigators was completely dedicated to this task, and they kept Mr. Smiley under surveillance 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This provided the police with detailed information about how the thefts were carried out. They followed him from the time he picked up his truck from the shipping company to the airport, where he loaded his truck, delivered the goods that were supposed to be delivered, and took the stolen cargo to his house. After all this, the police were ready to make their move. They broke into Smiley's house on December 13, 2001, and arrested the entire family, Mr. Smiley, his wife Teresa, and his steps and Benny. The police were astonished by the quantity of items that were inside the house. It was literally a warehouse. In addition to the mass amount of cash, it was in each corner of the house, under the bed, on the couch, in Benny's room, on the stairs, everywhere. They found up to $1.2 million in cash. Mr. Smiley, Teresa, and Benny were arrested on the charge of possessing stolen property, and before trial, Mr. Smiley agreed to plead guilty on the condition that Theresa and Benny had released. Because of his cooperation and his confession that he was responsible for the entire operation and gave back over $6 million in cash and property, the police accepted the deal and Mr. Smiley got a reduced sentence and served a two-year prison term. Now that we get to the end of the video, if you like it, don't forget to like and subscribe and activate the bell button.